I'm Bill Hoffman, Communications, Laboratory Medicine and Pathology. I'm here with Dr. Harry Orr. Dr. Orr is Professor and James Schindler and Bob Allison Ataxia Chair in Translational Research in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology. He's also the Director of the University's Institute of Translational Neuroscience. Well, m my father worked for a railroad and every time he got promoted, we moved. So we were on this cycle of starting in Virginia, Kentucky, back to Virginia. But I actually grew up in Michigan. Uh, we moved to Michigan, a suburb of Detroit, in, uh, uh, when I was in fifth grade. And uh, we didn't move out of Michigan. So I went to high school in, in, in Birmingham, Michigan, Birmingham Seaholm, and then to college at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan. Graduate school in neuroscience was Washington University in St. Louis. And then uh, a postdoc as a PhD, you do this in more intense research experience called the postdoctoral fellowship that was at Harvard in, in, in outside of Boston. You know, my dad was a civil engineer for a railroad, and um, high school was three years, uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. So the first two years, I took physics and chemistry. And then my senior year, I was stuck. I had to take one more science class, and it was biology. I loved it. I thought it was really fun, and uh, I was relatively good at it. <laughs> and then I just gradually moved sort of from, from uh, uh, an engineering track to, to a biology track and neuroscience. I got my PhD in neuroscience at WashU. This was 1976 and uh, a, a, a major breakthrough in research and particularly in genetics was the use of recombinant DNA, DNA sequencing and I went to Harvard postdoc to learn that and the lab I did a postdoc in was in immunology, worked on histocompatibility antigens. So as I left my postdoc, I was looking for jobs in immunology. And uh, uh, both my wife and I were from the Midwest, and we really wanted to come back to the Midwest. I knew the University of Minnesota and the really rich history of the state of Minnesota in supporting higher education. And there was a very strong immunology program here centered at that time at the transplant. Uh, a program in the Department of Surgery. So uh, I came to Minnesota working on HLA using the, quote, modern genetic techniques that I learned at Harvard. Okay, this is a story I, I often tell trainees. So I literally was sitting in my office when uh, uh, in walked a, a geneticist and a neurologist. And their line was, we have something you might be very interested in. So I said I was doing the genetics of HLA. And the human HLA genes are located on the short arm of chromosome 6. And this team of investigators had just shown that the disease in the neurologist family was linked to the HLA complex, i.e. on the same chromosomal region. And they knew I had my PhD in neuroscience and I was kind of looking how to move my genetic expertise back to neuroscience. And so uh, um, that's the start of our work on spinal cerebellar ataxia type one, which was the disease in the neurologist family. And I use this as an example for trainees. I always leave my, the office of my door open because you never know what's gonna walk through the door. In its simplest way, it's not uncommon. Uh, their, their symptoms look very similar to somebody who's had too much alcohol to drink. In fact, it's not uncommon for patients to be accused of being intoxicated by the gen general public when they're out and about. So they lose their balance, they have trouble walking, uh, they get slurred speech, and, and, and what we call ataxia, lack of coordination. The disease hits a region of the brain that is involved in coordinating our motor movements. And unfortunately, it progresses to other regions in the brain, and eventually the patients succumb or die from the symptoms. It hits the regions of the brain that can control swallowing and breathing. In, in, in this disease, your typical patient onset is around 40 or so, 35 to 45 with a period from onset to death of 10 to 15 years. But depending on the mutation, 
you can have juvenile forms of the disease, and the youngest patient that I'm aware of uh, onset was at four years of age. Well, we know the gene that's affected. We know the type of mutation. We know a lot about the underlying biology of the disease and how this mutation affects the protein from doing its normal function. And we also know that if we could target the expression of this gene, we'd have a very effective therapy. And in fact, there are several pharmaceutical companies now working on such strategies. I started working on, on this disease as a basic scientist. I was interested in the cool biology and trying to understand how that might tell us more about how the brain works. But as, as the years passed, I came, became in contact with more and more patients. And you know, as we said earlier, this is a lethal disease, and so more and more of these people passed away from the disease. And it, the human aspect of the disease became very quickly a, a major reason why we've kept our research going. Uh, I can't tell you how strong these patients are and what nice people they are, and it's just very, they're just incredible individuals, and it was great to get to know them, but very sad to lose so many of them. The Institute for Translational Neuroscience was found a little, founded a little bit less than 10 years ago, and it was an effort, one of the efforts to try to bolster the position of the university in neuroscience. And it comes from monies from central administration, so our mission is to impact more than just the medical school. So our major goal is to recruit new faculty, so-called what we call ITN scholars, to the university, and we have faculty now not only in the, in the medical school, also in the School of Pharmacy, as well as in the College of Science and Engineering. So in terms of translational neuroscience, there's people using basic neuroscience techniques and genetics, there's people using drug development, and people uh, uh, from using more engineering type of approaches, so-called medical devices, to address uh, uh, and, and alleviate symptoms of many of the neurological diseases. So my induction into the Institute of Medicine in 2014, now called the National Academy of Medicine, was a complete shock. I knew I had been nominated, but I didn't really give it much of a chance. And um, to be honest with you, I made a couple of phone calls after I got the email just to make sure <laughs> that it wasn't somebody scan trying to scam me. And um, it, you know, it's always a, it's always a pleasure particularly to be recognized by your peers. So it's an election by, your, by other members of the academy uh, and your peers. And I'm particularly proud of being uh, elected into what's called Section 2 of the National Academy of Medicine, which is uh, the basic science, so to speak, section of, of this academy. Why? I think that speaks to, I think it speaks to the quality of our research that we've done in our group. and. Um, um, that I'm very proud of that. So, you know, precision medicine is a, is an exciting area. Uh, hopefully, it will be mostly a good area. Um, help steer uh, uh, treatments where they're most effective. Steer us. I think one of the exciting things about precision medicine is steering us away from treatments, including the neurological diseases that are particularly uh, not efficacious for individuals or could even have uh, uh, unwanted side effects for a given individual. To be honest with you though, I think we need to be very careful. Precision medicine, DNA sequencing, um, we're still feeling our way. And so uh, as, as you feel your way in a new er area or, or new endeavor, there are some turns that aren't gonna be exactly the ones we wanna be taking. So I think my major message is right now is it is very exciting, it's very new, but keep both eyes open. The best example I have for that is in, in, in treating heart disease. Uh, there's an example, the specifics escape me at this moment, but in some individuals, a particular common drug can rather than be positive, be, have very negative uh, impact. And a simple DNA sequence analysis will identify those individuals so that then they are not put on this particular drug and put on, are put on other drugs that will better treat their, their symptoms, but not cause the damage that some individuals have with this one drug.